talking about um, the role of the sacred. The great teachers of our time have said that passion between two people is sacred. And if that's our principle that we're working with, then the question that we might ask ourselves is, um, what is, what is the state of the sacred in my relationship right now? And that can be with myself, it can be with my partner, it can be with God. But in using the principle in that way, we sort of find ourselves in a slightly different land to the normal one we live in. My, um, one of my mentors had this um, great saying, he'd say that when something was broken, his first question wasn't, how can I fix it? But how can I make this more beautiful? You can see that, that immediately we used to start living with a different relationship with whatever object you're living with. So in, in a way, part of what we're doing here is going question of how can I make this more beautiful rather than that voice in us which will um, if I asked you what is the state of your relationship right now you might go to a, well this isn't working and I'm not sure about this and you know that that voice that immediately goes to those places which is which is that fix it how am I going to fix it if we ask ourselves the question and we're looking at it from the place of what Sufism is um, has at the heart of it, which is the revelation of wisdom. If I asked her, what is the state of my relationship looking for the wisdom in it, which might mean having to deal with the pain, but it also might be seeing something that I haven't seen in myself or the other. So I hope that you'll use this work that we're doing around um, and the principles that we're working with in the passages as a way of kind of that dynamic relationship of really opening to to something else. I was thinking also about principles, something in the way that uh, Deepa was about, you know, talk about, you know, you ask a question like, you know, where is passion in your relationship or looking at passion in previous relationship or in your life? or asking where is the sacred in that relationship. As she was saying, we tend to go right to judgment. And it's really not necessary. It's not actually the proper place. That's this kind of assigning blame. But it's more like stepping into an awareness of where passion exists in you at any given moment. It's right there. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> and that doesn't require judgment, you know, to be in your relationship and saying, well, where is the spark of passion? It's not about judgment. Like, oh, it exists here or inside me at any given moment. Passion is right here. And if you go inside and you find that place, you know, it. for me, it's you know, like right now, it's an image of a kiss. A passion for me exists in a kiss. The idea of a kiss. So it's really not about judgment, it's about an awareness. You know, where is where is the sacredness of a relationship to you, in you? And then see if you can find it anywhere, any spark of it in those past relationships, in the current, in that thread. So when we're talking about principles, we're not talking about, um, um, and you know, and asking these questions around principles. Um, it's not talking about it like a fixed application, but just. Um, letting the principles like just flow into your awareness and see where you can find these things in your feeling states.
We are really going to talk about principles today and, and, and what I think are the most important principles in the, in the book. Principles uh, that have to do with polarity. And in a deep, grounded way, we, we are as individuals an interplay of masculine and feminine qualities in interplay. And then in all our relationships, it's an interplay of masculine and feminine qualities. And so in the earliest chapters in the book, he spends a lot of time talking about um, sex, half bodies, and uh, attraction and repulsion. And they're all around the principles of masculinity and femininity. Now, People are very excited when they see the first chapter, it says sex. And then they're very disappointed when they find he's not talking about sex. <laughs> and, and, and it's worth saying just a little something about that. I mean, one, in, in biological terms, sex is gender, not intercourse. <clears throat> but what he's talking about here, he says sex is direction. And meaning it's a, it's a movement in one direction or another, whether assertive or responsive. And he talks about half bodies and different things. And that this discussion made me think of, um, you know, one of the things that we're most familiar with out of the um, Jewish and Christian biblical tradition is you know the first things that we read and learn are about Adam and Eve and how Eve was taken from the rib of Adam and this this whole uh, myth that we come up with and and with which we now have many troubles this, with the idea that it presents us and I was thinking about how worthwhile it is to understand it from the original Hebrew. And from the Jewish mystical tradition, which bases itself on a, a, a real analysis of what these terms meant. And so I, I just want to look at that for a second, these verses from Genesis. Genesis 1, 26 through 27. It says, let us make the human in our image, in our likeness. Now, you know, you usually read, let us make Adam in our image, in our likeness. But Adam, 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 comes from the Adama. Adama means earth, clay. Adam is the word for human. It means an earthling, an earth being, something made out of the material substance of the planet. And so when we first hear about Adam, we're, the Bible is only talking about an, an earthling, a human has been formed. And listen to what it says. Let us make the human in our image, in our likeness. Who is the our? See, this is what's getting asked in the, in the Jewish mystical tradition. What our? <clears throat> um, and we could read that as the, the divine masculine and the divine feminine in dialogue about what, what child they're going to make together. And, and that child will have qualities of both, the divine masculine and divine feminine. So let us make the human in our image, male and female. So then it says, so God created the human in the divine image. In the image of God were they created Male and female were they created. So this hour says, let us make a human. And then it says, so God created the human 
in the divine image, in the image of God were they created. The human, they. Interesting, right? And then it says male and female were they created. So why shouldn't we think that it's uh, why shouldn't we think that it's talking about two two beings? Even though it just said make the human, why shouldn't we think it's talking about two beings that were created? Because later in Genesis two eighteen it says, "It is not good for the human to be alone. I will make a partner for the human." And then we get that that example that we're used to, that, you know, it's not good for Adam, the human, to be alone, so we'll make a partner. And then, and then we learn that God took a rib from the human and then made Eve, Hava in Hebrew, the life giver. Hava means the life giver. Except, except the word that's being translated as rib doesn't mean rib at all. What it actually says is, let us take a part or a half or a side of the human and make a partner. Not a rib, take a part or a half. <clears throat> so the notion that we actually get and that is understood in the Jewish mystical tradition is that the original human was an androgynous being, both masculine and feminine. And male and female were they created, this human. And, and what is understood in the Jewish mystical tradition is that they were as if back to back. The masculine side was here and the feminine side was on the back side, and so there were the two faces, one facing this way, one facing that way, and, and that God divided them so that they could turn and face one another and meet and communicate, so that they could learn one another as separate beings. But the original being was both masculine and feminine, and it maintains those those qualities, they still have those qualities of one another, but now they have the challenge of turning to meet and face one another and learning to communicate face to face. And that this is what happened. So it's, it was not this thing of oh, God, God forth, drew forth out of the man, the woman, you know. Uh, it was, there was an original being that was both masculine and feminine and separated them so that they could turn and face one another. So this, this idea of, um, of polarity is there from the beginning, you know, from, from our most primary scripture in the, the Judeo-Christian tradition. <clears throat> and the need to communicate around this polarity is, is, well, it's the most significant thing in our lives. Sex is direction. Two is a part of one growing out of one. As the conductor guides the music, each movement of the baton demands a second movement. A single motion is not possible. A single stroke has no meaning. But as soon as there is a second motion, then the rhythm of the music begins. In the same way, every single expression of activity reveals two aspects or directions of the same action. These may be distinguished from each other as positive and negative aspects. Okay, so we see just from this paragraph that when he uses the word direction, he's talking about aspects. Um, and when he's talking about positive and negative, he doesn't mean good and bad. It's like, uh, you know, you hear if, if you're an artist, you talk about negative space, right? 
uh, he's positive and negative he's talking about, assertive and receptive, uh, uh, active and responsive, two different qualities. Uh, the assertive, positive, is masculine. The receptive, responsive, feminine. It's not a value judgment. It's just two, two pairings in the universe that are, that are a constant. These are bo both at work at all times. He says, otherwise, there's nothing. There's, um, uh, there's, no, there's no music. There's no vibration. Vibration is a peak in a valley, peak in a valley, peak in a valley, peak in a valley. So he's talking about uh, if the conductor makes one movement with a baton, da, there's nothing to get excited about. Da, da. Then you have something. And it doesn't have to go high, low. Da, da. It can go up. But that's the basis of things. The, the second is a response to the other. The first is just assertive. La, la. Not that those make any sense in conducting either. <laughs> I don't know music at all. I know this, though, that you need the two sounds to make uh, anything of rhythm. And that's what he's saying, that the, the interplay of masculine and feminine is a rhythm. One thing asserts, another thing responds. And then maybe that response is seen as an assertion. And then there's a counter response. And it's, it's a play, it's a dance, it's a movement. And so, uh, again, it being about masculine and feminine and not male and female, so you take it out of that frame and say the masculine was the assertion. And, and then the feminine was a response to that assertion. But again, that feminine response could be interpreted as an assertion from the masculine, which then has a response itself, which is feminine. This is, this is just a movement, back and forth, back and forth. My purpose is to have sex all the time. When I think about it from the perspective of this, that to be here for the time that I'm going to be here, I want to be in that responsive, assertive dance that we're doing. And I think that part of what life is about is getting to become a more refined and better dancer. So if we see this again as not, I'm just kind of bringing us back to, there's no right or wrong in it. There's just this like, oh, that was a response. Now what does that mean in terms of where I go next? So that idea of, of um, it's what I like about this, this particular chapter of like, ah, what does like look like when we're all having sex? Every act of our life as we work our way thus, shows these same two aspects or directions, one expressive, the other responsive. It is through the reciprocal action of these two factors that each of our activities advances towards, towards perfection. And it's every and its every activity shows two aspects, two directions, which balance and complete each other, giving light and shade to the picture, giving rhythm to the music, developing the vision of perfection. There is um, one of the 10 Sufi thoughts is, um, there is one moral law, the law of reciprocity. It's quite a thing to, to talk about morality in that way and to sort of assert that that's, that's the law of our time. And we can see it here, which is why when I think that Hazrat Nayak Khan places so much importance on the relationship between lovers, if that changes in our world, what will our world look like? 
What will it look like when we're in this reciprocal relationship with response and action? And I think that's what feels like um, the opportunity of our time. One of the things, if we were to look at the male and female relationship, it's the first time in history, really, that men and women are able to talk at somewhat of an equal level. We've never got there. We're not quite there. But there's a, the, that's the adventure of our time, that reciprocity, that action and response. So I think... Um, if you would just to take a minute before we move on to the next part and see what's, what's the role of reciprocity in your thread right now? Or your intention? Can you feel what the response and the assertion are? I was just thinking about how how convoluted it is. Uh, it's like, uh, you know, I, w I was just uh, talking about it, and you, you see the trap of the language, the masculine and the feminine, the assertion and the response. Um, but if I, I'm playing the masculine, masculine role, and Deepa's playing the feminine role, and I assert, and she responds, but my interpretation of her response is, is that she's masculine asserting and I'm responding. So it really is a dance, and the roles are very fluid, you see. And, and even though, we, you know, even though we haven't quite got there with um, gender equality, the discussion has already moved on way beyond that, where the discussion is gender fluidity, and, and where that, you know, what that means. And so, the growing edge of consciousness is way beyond uh, where um, the status of society might be. And it's always pulling it forward, pulling it forward. Um, and so I do think that, you know, yes, and hopefully 80 years on from now, people will look back at us and say, oh, God, they were crude. <laughs> how, how crude, how funny, still talking about it that way. Um, but yeah, it is pulling us onward, this, this dynamic rhythm, this interplay, pulling us onward, uh, developing the vision of perfection. It's through reciprocal action that each of these two factors, reciprocal action that each of these two factors or activities advances toward perfection. Yeah, the dance slowly perfects itself. And you think about that as the dialogue of your relationship. Slowly perfecting itself, as long as it's still a dialogue and still reciprocal. It works it out. It will work it out. As long as it doesn't stop the dialogue and reciprocity, reciprocity doesn't stop. You know, that's the one moral. That we're actually still hanging in there and giving when given to. And it's a beautiful thing. I'm just realizing <clears throat> when I read Rasa Shastra, it's like Mushid goes into, as Antana was saying, he talks about class, he talks about the role of nationalities. There's all of these things that you kind of go, why are these things in this book about sex? But it's you can see that once once you start really engaging in this subject, that it actually does become um about everything that you could, you know, that's happening in our world, which is why I have the purpose. So to, it's wonderful to see how it can be life-changing on so many levels. Yeah, there's such there's tremendous sophistication in what he's presenting. It's like he he's really looking at like how youth, you know, the the hormonal changes of youth affect, you know, the, our choices that we make about partners. Uh, the idealism of youth, how it will reach out um, in terms of biological systems for diversity. You know, in your youth, you're much more open to different sorts of relationships. And, and he said that bio biology is driving because biological systems love diversity because they know a closed system breaks down and degenerates. So he's really presenting the most sophisticated version of things. He's just doing it from 1915 or 1916. 
but it doesn't actually get more sophisticated than, than those principles. So from chapter two, the other half, he writes, in Sanskrit, woman is called Ardangi, the half body, half of that complete body that is constituted of both male and female which is, is not a, uh, it's not a denigrating thing. It's acknowledging what we just acknowledged with, with Adam and Hava, Adam and Eve. This is half of a human, and this is half of a human. Together, they make a human. So the Sanskrit is acknowledging this, you know? This, this one, one of these names for woman is half body. Throughout creation, each element attracts to itself its like. As Sadi says, each element returns in time to the single goal of that element. So now he's talking about the human. The human is a whole of masculine and feminine, so it's trying to integrate. It's trying to bring both halves together all the time. This law is more clearly observed in the attraction that exists between the sexes and is indeed the chief reason of the attraction between these two halves, which are derived from each other. Each sex is made of the element of the opposite sex, the female born of the seed of the male and the male molded in the womb of the female. <clears throat> Yeah, I don't know if you can say it much better. Yeah, the default position biologically is is female. And then a switch gets turned or not. <clears throat> Which also, if we were to say that the, the first state is the one of being responsive, being open, and that the action arises out of that, and then and then it goes that that if we were to take to our relationships in any way of just uh, like ah i'm here i'm open i'm responsive so that the action can arise from from that place the listening heart yeah and he makes this at one point he says something about how uh, <coughs> the response is born out of the assertion that's true there's an assertion, and then there's a response. And so he says, so there's a truth into saying uh, the feminine comes from the masculine. But then again, uh, radical openness um, creates a place for an assertion. And you could say the masculine is born from the feminine that way, you know? So th this really is a dance. You can't quite put it one way or another. So it goes on. Each sex clearly perceives that one provides the other with what the other lacks. Each draws out something in the other that would otherwise be lost. It's not a great sentence. Each draws out something in the other that would otherwise be lost. It brings to life some part of the other that would otherwise remain dormant. Each sex demands from the other thoughtfulness and consideration. It is through this contrast that the loving nature in man or woman is awakened, so that the heart, previously a grave of love, becomes fertile soil where any seed of affection can flourish, bearing flower and fruit. Our partner may draw from the other, from the other, one partner may draw from the other who is different, a spiritual quality, a moral quality, a talent, a merit, or a virtue, form, a virtue formerly enclosed in a shell. As the pearl lies in the depth of the sea to become valuable only when brought up and used. 
these are properties of the spirit which are in its depth, waiting a lifting hand, and which are brought to the surface only through help from the opposite sex. There's, there's a really beautiful truth there, and he says it right here. In each is the completion of the other. This, this more subtle truth of, of what we're doing in relationship. Like, um, if I have a very powerful attraction to this woman, um, and, and, oh, she's got this quality. God, that's an intoxicating quality. I want that. And what we most often do is say, uh, I want her. I want to possess her because of that quality. Not realizing the more subtle thing is we're recognizing uh, a vibration or an echo of a quality that we have in ourselves that is underdeveloped or that wants to be developed. And the only way to get it to develop, develop is to attune. Now she's got it and it's vibrating in a, in a way that I can feel. And I want to be with her long enough so that I can get that vibration, tune to it, and then it grows in me. And that's not to say that the relationship is merely, merely uh, about uh, taking qualities from one another. But it's to say that uh, what we want is not actually to possess the other person, but we recognize qualities that are inherent in us that they have active that we could develop. And likewise, if, it, if it's reciprocal, we have something that they can develop. And I saw this in my marriage. I was married for a very long time, 25 years. And I saw over the course of the marriage that I acquired some of her qualities, you know, where as a young man, I'd been very like, you know, very um, kind of, I was either very, very high or very, very low, you know, like I, was, I either thought I was Superman or I thought I was lower than a worm. And it was problematic, you know, because I had a lot of gifts, but I couldn't manifest them often because I was, I could when I was in this uh, inflated state but the next thing I would drop so low that I couldn't do anything. So I, it's, a, it's a very poor self-esteem. But, but my wife was a very steady person. And through her, I learned, I acquired a middle. I kept tuning to her. And my states slowly came to a middle where I was balanced and disciplined. And I've just found it through her. So today, I'm, I'm very much that person. It's very beautiful what you're saying. And I just realized that last week in The New Scientist, there was a, a report about neuroscience is discovering that actually couples um, end up with one memory. So, so, so this again is what we're talking about, that, that the longer a couple is together, that they remember, each one will kind of take on remembering different facets. So they become like one memory. And the more intimacy there is between a couple, the more likely there is to be that one, that sense of one memory. So it's, it's you know, again, we're going to, okay, so neuroscience is now discovering this. It's seeing it in the brain patterning of couples. It's really fascinating to... Yeah. And, and the reason we can attune is we have mirror neurons. We can attune, you know, we can catch that quality. But in the therapeutic situation, I was often pointing out, it's not about possessing that person, it's about possessing that person's quality over time. It's inherent in you and you want to have it and you want to learn it. And that's where the dance of the relationship is. Oh, your quality is intoxicating. I want it. Do I have a quality that you want? And, and through our communication, we acquire a larger being. We not only become uh, developed and full in ourselves, but we develop uh, a fuller united being. And this should be the goal. But it gets lost often in, I want that person, I'm going to have them. Uh, instead of giving them enough freedom in the relationship to actually learn from, see, it's, it's a distraction to think that you, you have to possess the person. 
instead of learn from them. And then you lose the relationship, you lose the reciprocity. So he's really talking about how we have qualities that complete one another in a basic masculine feminine sense, but also just qualitatively where there's something to learn from another. A man who is called handsome always represents some trait of the refinement of the feminine. And in the same way, a man's beautiful personality has a touch of the gentleness of the female nature. Nor can a woman's beauty of character be complete without some of that strength and dignity which is masculine. We wanted to highlight this passage because while we're talking about the external relationship, there is, of course, also the internal relationship that we have between our own masculine and feminine. And our awareness of, of how they're playing out with each other, the dance that goes on in, within us of this, so that that strength and nobility is present as well as that feminine, is, is just something that we wanted to kind of touch on. What do we look like when we feel that dance within ourselves? Where, where is my strength and nobility right now in relation to my thread? Where am I? Where can I bring that quality of gentleness to myself? So that relationship with self and that self-knowledge is, is also kind of a sort of central to, to what we're talking about here, and we don't want to forget that at, at any time. And to ask yourself, you know, uh, what, are, what are my masculine qualities? What does that mean? Again, not with any judgment, or, uh, but just like, what are my masculine qualities? What are my assertive qualities? What is, uh, what is that a strong, you know, as he describes here, as, as a kind of dignity of being? Is that my masculine quality? What are my feminine qualities? And it's a, it's, it's a great dialogue to have with yourself, a playful dialogue. So for me, I think of my feminine qualities as um, as some things that people might consider some people might consider masculine. So the wilder aspects of my being, I consider my feminine aspects. The part of me that loves to dance, uh, uh, that even even the part of me that would would take my lover in my arms in a very strong, forceful way, I think of that as a feminine quality. The wild divine as she's described, you know, in like the Hindu tradition, uh, kind of a Kali energy. Well, a Shakti energy. A Shakti energy, which means energy, yeah. Can I say something? No. You know, one of the... the <laughs> Stop asking. <laughs> the, the, one of my f favorite stories is about Shiva and Shakti in that she was there sitting on a mountain, like into nothing, just like I'm going into emptiness. And there is Shakti who falls in love with him and who's not going to let go. She is going to be there at every opportunity. And, and we is, but she does it in this extraordinary way that there's a point at which he, he has to kind of wake up and recognize that she's not going anywhere. And that ability to be persistent and constant in that way, that as a woman has been um, a learning of, of how to, to again do that dance within myself of remaining constant and yet as soft as possible. She has, so it totally makes sense for you to say you see that as a, a feminine quality because she certainly displays that in, in that union what's interesting there is because so in in many traditions the divine masculine is actually stillness quiet aloofness and and the divine feminine is everything in nature that's active and moving and passionate and and the divine masculine is just this steady solid presence 
and she's everything that's movement. But what I'm thinking about there is that Shiva is he's seated in his meditation and she's dancing around him and she's not leaving. And every once in a while he opens an eye, she's still there. <laughs> oh, but I'm, I'm in my meditation, she's still there. But what's interesting is that her like commitment, I, like I want him, I want him. I'm going to keep doing this dance. I'm going to keep doing this dance. And in a sense, she is learning a masculine quality from him because he's embodying his masculine quality. So I'm being solid. I'm being solid. Now, she is being herself. She's moving, moving. But her, <coughs> her masculine that she's learning from his solidity is to be constant, to never leave. She's continuing to circle him. She's not going away until he has to respond to her. So you see how the dance really works? Through the interplay, he's being his masculine, and she's being her feminine, but she's acquiring his quality, and it's going to make him move. Then he will be, he'll have acquired the feminine. So it's amazing, it's amazing. Uh, they say that uh, when Shiva and Shakti finally got together, they um, they made love for four days, and eventually um, the priests had to go up to them and say, please stop the earthquakes. We cannot cope with your love, which is which is that also that that feeling of what happens when that movement has arisen. So, so the dance is a is a very beautiful one. They say in um, well, Tulsi Das, a mystic, says of the tantras, which is what Hinduism has has, has given to this subject, that it wouldn't that they wouldn't exist. Those teachings wouldn't exist if Shakti hadn't been asking questions of Shiva. Mm -hmm. So that 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 there's this story of that it's never one one thing, it's always this extraordinary dance and dialogue between the two. That's what, it's actually, it's funny, it's what Joseph Campbell said. He says, the only reason we know the name Joseph Campbell today is because he taught at Sarah Lawrence, which was a, a women's school. And he's there, he, he knows his subjects, he's talking about the things that he's passionate about, but he couldn't talk for two minutes before a hand went up that said, what does that mean for my life? <laughs> And he said, these young women constantly asked him this question. And so he started reframing. He was talking about ideas, 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 ideas. But they wanted to know how you applied those ideas. And he said, those young women made me the person I am now. And all the way he talked about myth that was relevant to all of us today were because he taught at Sarah Lawrence. Shakti asked questions. Why? How does that apply to me? What are you talking about? I don't, I don't even care if, if it can apply this. That's the feminines always saying, I want to apply it. I want to plant it. I want, I want it to grow something. Whereas the aloof masculine is happy to go off into the idea realm. So I'm hoping that this is all applying. <laughs> <laughs> We're looking at you, looking out at the live stream going, is this applying? Or are they sitting there going, well, how does this apply to me? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Seems a good place to move to attraction and repulsion, doesn't it? Attra I love this section, by the way. Yeah. Attraction and repulsion in sex depend upon the workings of the positive and negative forces in life. Although the male sex may generally be characterized as the positive and the female as the negative force in humanity, this characterization doesn't necessarily hold good in all planes of existence. It can easily be seen that when a positive power is confronted by a power that resembles itself, but is positive to still a greater degree, it becomes negative as a talkative person becomes a listener in the presence of one still more talkative. In the same way, a negative power ceases to be negative, but becomes positive in the presence of a power that is similar to or still more negative than itself. I think it's interesting if you think about 
what he says about the negative. The negative therefore represents beauty, while the positive represents power. For power is, is not of itself beautiful. Power is attracted to beauty, and its desire may be called beauty, and its power becomes powerless before beauty. That's kind of the things that we were just referring to in this conversation. But um, as you love it so much, Ntanong, what do you have to say about it? <laughs> Yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I, I, it's easy to get lost in this language, but what he's saying is very clear in terms of circumstances that we get into all the time. Even if I'm known, if I'm uh, known to be a really opinionated, loud person, very talkative, um, in the presence of a person who is louder and more exuberant, then then I see I will I will just get quieter, and I seem like the opposite pole. And so the terms are relative, given the situation. So I you know, away from that person, I'll be thought of as the masculine assertive. But next to that person, I'll be thought of as the feminine because they have more of that. And so the roles are very fluid. They're, they're changing all the time. Oh, and power and beauty. You know. And so the power of being masculine here and beauty being feminine. So that there's no necessary beauty in, in an assertion. But how it's held, see, that's just power. That's an act. But then how it's held is where the beauty comes in. So, um, you know, the, the basic act of making and serving tea, you know, hot water, cup, tea bag, or, or tea, you know, and pour, pouring boiling water in it. That, that could all be just a masculine act. Now, the way it's done in a tea ceremony, a Japanese tea ceremony, where it's how many times is the cup turned, how is it poured, being present to, you know, the fragrance as it rises, you know, as the infusion is happening and the fragrance arises, and how it's stirred, all of that is the feminine. That's making beauty out of an assertive act. How is the whole thing held? And so that, it's how we can see power and beauty in relationship. Beauty is how the assertion is shaped or held. <clears throat> I love that movement. And often he's, uh, he'll talk about how the masculine is attracted to beauty. Uh, the masculine, or rather the masculine is attracted to beauty, the masculine is transformed through its attraction to beauty. You know, the, that old kind of silly line, you know, um, beauty's, uh, you know, tame the savage beast. But it does. Um, beauty transforms us. Uh, our attraction to it changes us. Um, I'm thinking one. about the experience of standing in front of that <clears throat> stunning tree just yes, when we, you walk out. Just when we walked in. And it, it's, it's the color of it, is, it's like it's, it demands that you stop and look. It's like here. And and Natana was just saying to me, that's the power of beauty, that it's made that demand. And, and in that stopping, there's, there's just this like, wow. And our lives need wows. They need them so much. They're like the the water that quenches the thirst that's so deep we don't know it. So again, it's at play there of the power of it. Mm -hmm. And what we said there is we were walking in and we were stopped and struck by the tree, this beautiful flowering tree right outside of the meditation hall, is that I said, you see, your masculine is responding to the feminine in nature. Beauty in it is transforming your masculine. It's yeah. arresting it. And... <coughs> 
just the way you know a man is you know a heterosexual male is is arrested by the beauty of a woman but then he's changed by her he's changed by his own interest in her beauty but it's not just male female this right there your masculine was responding to the tree so no no it's cool so let's talk about repulsion yeah. or disharmony as he puts it Disharmony results when one or the other is frustrated in the desire for self-expression. Frustrated in the desire for self-expression. But harmony is more natural than disharmony. The union of male and female should provide an opportunity within that union for both to attain to the fullest expression of which they are capable. Neither should find within it an obstacle which impedes his or her fullest development. Every soul is indeed seeking completion, a search that too often ends in the destruction of beauty. Since the human being deluded and ensnared by the surface life forgets to look inward and discover the nature of the I, which is so, which so desperately desires satisfaction. Deluded and ensnared by the surface of life, forgets to look inward. Such a simple act to deal with our repulsion or our disharmony. And there discover the nature of the I, which is which so desperately desires satisfaction. So th that's really on the part of still still talking about how we complete one another. But he gets into an actually really juicy aspect of compulsion or attraction and repulsion. And I really love this section. Repulsion is caused either through a lack of power or scope on the part of the positive or the negative. So um, if you're feminine, you're repulsed by a lack of power in the masculine. Or if you're masculine, you're repulsed by a lack of scope on the part of the feminine. When the positive or masculine has not the power to draw to itself the negative or feminine, drawing it halfway or a little more or less, that lack of power may actually repel the negative or feminine. So if he's kind of milk toast, it's like, it's repellent. Uh, the, the, the feminine wants the masculine to stand fully in its masculinity, to really seem powerful in it and sovereign and whole as attractive. And any, any lack in that, um, uh, it tends to repel the feminine from it. Even if he's saying, but I love you. It's, because it's what's wanted is, I love you. But I love you. You know? You feel the qualitative difference there? Uh, and it's not like, it's, it, it's not that she's saying, you're not being somebody else. You're, you know, you, John, are not being Rick, who's more masculine. What she's saying is, you, John, are not being you, John. Stand up in yourself as you are fully. You're not living up to who you are. And this is something that men often don't understand in this, in this kind of gender normative relationship. They're being asked to be themselves fully, not somebody else. So this is great. This is about polarized dynamics. 
Okay, talk to me about the feminine then in this. You've just talked about the role of the... I'm sorry, I was <laughs> talking about the role of the feminine. That's no, what the feminine was. <laughs> I, I think that there's there's one thing to say you're you're not standing up in it, but it's like what's what's the equivalent for the masculine? Do you see what I mean? Like what makes it repulsive? Oh, what's repulsive in the yeah. feminine? Yeah, for the masculine. Um, well, as he puts it here, uh, if the masculine is, masculine is fully in that and and wants to assert itself and and be fully masculine, then what's repellent is that that the feminine is not giving space for that, is not, uh, as, he, as he puts it, mm -hmm. is not providing scope, is not responding. Um, you know, the masculine makes a lot of demands, trust me, and then too much, you know, Lack of that is, you know, is kind of, kind of becomes repellent, uh, you know, um, or a lot of, I don't know. This is this is it gets into difficult spaces. Um, <laughs> Shall we go there? Yeah. Because <laughs> um, I, I think sometimes I can be like very assertive, and I've witnessed that can be repulsive for a man. I'm like, I'm supposed to be doing the chasing. You know, I'm doing the chasing. Mm -hmm. But maybe an example: if a woman chases a man, it masculine. Masculinity that she's done all the work, mm -hmm. so then he's just being lazy and he's lost his. Um, the, yep. the yeah, it, and I mean that's an example, and um, and it can work that way. Uh, I mean, sometimes I like to be chased, <laughs> but but that's my feminine wanting to be chased. Chasing a Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there is again. there is something about um, I don't know how good you all are at waiting. There's something about that that responsiveness within us that that quality of just being able to stay here and wait. And um, Keats called it negative capability which is there's nothing to do but just to wait. And within that, again, we're back to where we started, there is an, there's an action that can come as a result. And I would say that what we are, um, what the repulsion might be for the masculine and the feminine is, is, is our lack of ability to wait. We just, just to, stay and allow something to build, the tension to build. There's a, a desire, and I'll put it in this way, there's a desire in a man um, for a woman that is very difficult to catch. Um, Be careful, girls. Yeah. Um, once because because it's the sense of the ultimate prize uh, the one that challenges you to the extreme that develops you through the chase the the thing that is most hard to hunt and most difficult to catch is the biggest prize it challenges all, all of your qualities. It makes you dig into all of your resources to develop to who you could be. So the woman that challenges you most also develops you most. And she makes you who you are by, by, the, by the chase of her, by her continually rising uh, and not being easily caught. The, e the more easily a woman is to catch, the less she's respected. <clears throat> Go on, finish the one. But the more she's in the dance with you, the more the more she respects herself, the more she puts up boundaries, which men tend to hate boundaries, but the more she asserts them for her own purposes, the more he has to rise, 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 rise. And and so it's not 
it's not exactly repulsion for men. It's like, I don't have a big interest there. I caught her. I had that. But the woman you can never quite catch, and I don't mean one that's uh, coy and just toying with you, but the woman that is so, um, so sovereign, has such a sense of her own dignity, that says, no, you, you have to be, be worthy of me, then that's a challenge she likes, to become more and more worthy. Um, because he knows that she is the ultimate prize. He's always searching for the ultimate prize. So it's, it's not so much about repulsion, it's about maintaining interest, interest, interest. And so now, you know, I've, I've gone mass, male, females for the purpose of giving you a very practical example for me. But that's masculine. Masculine wants whatever is wanted to be worthy of the wanting <coughs> and wants uh, that beauty to change them, to make them rise into themselves. And that's what the feminine is often demanding. On the other side, we saw it. No, stand in yourself. And so there's the tension. So the masculine is wanting the ultimate prize. I think we can, what I want to say is, as you were talking, I was realizing that, of course, we can relate this to, to, to a heterosexual relationship, but we could also relate this to anything that's going on in our lives. You yeah. know, the, 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 the thing that demands the most of us, we, we'll stay with it. We'll, we'll, we want to kind of get to where we, where we might go, want to go with it. The, the, the things we might want to look at is where do we give up? on that what is it that that um says oh we can't do it or what are the voices that don't allow us to carry on that pursuit i don't think that pursuit is just in the relationship it's it's in ourselves constantly it's in me when i think about how i want to know what the power of love is i will not give up until i know what the power of love is i will do everything in my possession to do that mm -hmm. but, the, but the beauty of it is of course in the falling when i'm when i'm kind of like i'm never going to get there in that place if i really truly allow myself to fall then there's an opportunity for 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 god i'll come back to to have surrendered to this moment for god to say come i'm here Let's stand, let's see. So, so we can look at it from that point, point of view, but we can also really relate it to anything that's um, happening within us. And there's a particular, there's, there's a answer. There are many answers as ever to this, but here's an answer to, to it. It comes from a wonderful um, architect called Christopher Alexander whose key work has been about building um, communal spaces where communities can thrive. And he's written a series of books. Um, the fourth one is called Luminous Nature. And having explored everything about how you get to this place of a communal building where communities thrive, he says he has one prescription for creating that kind of building or structure to make it living. And it's counterintuitive to what we would normally think about because his prescription is to truly please ourselves. And when you hear that to begin with, it's like, what? Truly please ourselves. And he says, it might sound absurd to say that, but if you do this, you will reach transcendent unity. And what he means by that is for us to actually pursue this in our journey, we have to truly, truly is a really important word, know ourselves to be able to know what truly pleases us. Most of us don't really know what truly pleases us. I'm not talking about that surface level. I'm talking about that where you can feel it in yourself. We've had moments of truly feeling pleasure. And it, it has that 
that sense of everything feels alive and everyone benefits from that sense of truly pleasing ourselves. <coughs> now, this is why we have that, that statement about self-knowledge. We came here, we go back to what um, we talked about last night in passion, that we're here to experience life for the creator. If we really allow ourselves to truly experience it in each moment so that we can really learn what it is that pleases us. It took me months to discover what my favorite fruit was. I assumed it was one thing from when I was a kid, but that was just what it was when I was a kid. I never went back. I just kind of went, oh yeah, that's my favorite fruit. But it was a sudden kind of like, well, I don't know if that's true. So then I had to eat different fruit, right? To kind of go, what's the tra taste that truly pleases me? So that, that discovery, that's, that it seems is like the joy of being alive and of being on this planet. And we get to wake up every day and go, okay, what's this 24 hours gonna bring for me to discover what truly pleases me? So I think for the, <clears throat> for the masculine, if we went back to your thing, when we as, as the women in this allow ourselves that opportunity to truly please ourselves, what happens to us? How do we look? How do we feel? What's the response that we give the world? <laughs> 